You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, we find ourselves in the final week of our short series called Rooted, and we've used Psalm 1 to unpack this and really look at what does it mean to have a certain set of disciplines and um, an active living lifestyle that produces a closer walk with Christ, a closer walk with his community, and understanding the impact and power of gathering together. Um, I've, I've, I don't know why, but I've enjoyed this so much. I understand that, um, you know, really for the foundry, when we said what our weekly rhythm was going to be, which is devotions, being in the Word of God, um, being in the big work worship gathering of God, and then being in in a smaller cluster of people, understanding we have to um, connect and be known and know others, it it speaks clearly to me. Um, It's not a program. It's a simple lifestyle that uh, roots us in relationship. And I want to talk today um, about the idea of having a seat. Um, We've talked again through Psalm 1. We'll talk about that in a minute. But when I say have a seat, a certain image comes to mind. Louis Giglio, the pastor at Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, taught a sermon, and I was listening to him preach, and it just, I'd never seen it that way. And I loved what he said. He said, uh, when he unpacked Psalm 23, he said, you know, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. And he said, quite often what happens is the devil comes up, and by the way, at Foundry Church, we believe in the devil. We believe there is an evil, and he is evil, and he opposes God in everything. We have a mortal enemy who seeks our destruction, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But Louis says the devil quite often comes up to that table that was prepared in the presence of our enemies, sits down at it, and starts talking to us, and distracts us, and speaks um, lies over our lives. He speaks half-truths. He mimics the word of God, but he never fully embraces it. You know, it's this mocking, horrible voice. And I loved the idea of that because what I know to be true in my life, and I'm guessing in yours too, is that Satan has been doing the same thing he did since Genesis 3. When he looked at Eve, the very first woman, and he said, did God really say dot, 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 question mark? And then he misquotes God. When we talk today about who's sitting at your table, who's sitting at your life and having conversation and relationship with you, it matters profoundly who you sit with, what you give your ear to, and what you participate in. And we want to look at it and kind of take a bare-knuckled approach to it because we need to know the power of, well, who sits closely and intimately in our lives and has access to give voice to what's going on. So, Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked, stand in the path that sinners take, or sit in the seat of mockers. Today we will talk about mockers. And we understand that the wicked is not some green hook-nosed witch, it's actually those who are just apart from God those who are apart from God and don't know God and maybe have never put their life under the counsel of the Scriptures, right? They've never lived under the law of God, the counsel of God in Scripture. We understand that sinners, which we all were at one point, are those who um, actively um, live a lifestyle of sin and choose to have no affiliation with God, the counsel of Scripture, or the community of believers. Today we turn our attention towards mockers, and we'll unpack that. But hear this again, this rhythm of these three things. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the path that sinners take, stand in the way, uh, in the path excuse me, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the path that the wicked take, stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Rather, the blessed one, they delight in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on that law, the law of God, the counsel of God in Scripture. They meditate on it day and night, and their life will be like a tree that is planted by a stream of water, and it will give its fruit in season, and its leaves will never wither, and whatever the righteous blessed one puts their hand to will prosper, but not so the wicked. The wicked are different. They are like chaff. Remember chaff is that little onion paper thin kind of uh, thing that's around the kernel of wheat. And when the wind blows the chaff once separated from the wheat, it just blows it away. And that's what scripture says. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff and the wind blows them away. That's why the wicked won't stand in the judgment and they won't be in the assembly of the righteous. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We find ourselves stepping into this rhythm and asking ourselves, blessed is the one 
who doesn't sit in the seat or among the mockers. What does that mean? What does it mean to sit among the mockers? It's one of these things that we have to talk about and be very uncomfortable with because when we talk about a mocker, we need to understand a mocking spirit in this world, a mocking spirit taunts and ridicules God's work in your life. And it sounds very eerily similar to Genesis 3 when it says things like, really, did God say you're redeemed? Does Jesus really love you? Does the Bible really say so? Are you good enough? Are you worthy? Satan always puts in these little questions that undermine and erode our confidence in the truth of God. It is a mocking spirit that is opposed to the work, the authority, and the love of God in this world. A mocking spirit, you could say, that uh, lives in this progression. Remember, we had the ungodly, the wicked, apart from God, sinners, willfully apart from God. Now we're kind of taking, we've gone down this ladder from wicked to sinners. Now we end up in the stank, dank basement, a little musty, a little nasty, where the mockers live, where it gets really ugly, where it's not, um, there's no veil between what their motives are. Mockers find themselves having no regard for God. Not only do they live a life of sin, but they think sin is a joke. They think the thing that um, caused Christ to die on the cross is a joke. And we in this church need to understand and forever hold on to that each one of us is sinful. That's why Christ died. Sin separated us from God. That's why Jesus died, to redeem us out of sin and put us back in relationship with God. When we talk about sin, it matters. It matters supremely because it's the reason Christ came. And when mockers make a joke or make light of sin, well, then they become the tempter to other people. They make fun of the choices that uh, people who are trying to live faithfully make. They mock them and ridicule them. They enjoy tearing people down, seeing them stumble. Mockers make fun of God's authority. They scoff and laugh at those who think that sin has any consequences. They are malevolent. They are bitter. They are angry, and they are ruthless in their pursuit to do exactly as Scripture describes Satan, that we have an adversary, and he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he may destroy. That is a mocker. It is one who sits actively opposed to God. The danger of being in the company of mockers is this. There's a pecking order, right? Anybody here ever been around a mocker? Help me out. Work your right arms out. Come on. Help a brother out up here. Yeah. You ever sit with people who mock? I know this. I went from a Christian school to a public school in sixth grade, and I realized very quick because I was fleet of tongue that I could make jokes and mock other people and get above the lowest rung. I came in on the low rung. And I wasn't going to stay there long. And I regret that I bullied, insulted, mocked, and heckled people to the point where I thought people liked me, but they didn't like me. They just didn't want to be on the other side of me. And then I moved to California in eighth grade. And I found myself a little redneck boy in 501s in a pretty, you know, happy-go-lucky western West Coast city and went, oh, here we go again. And I would mock and ridicule and get myself back up the ladder because there's a pecking order when it comes to mockers. There's a scale, and you don't want to be on the bottom of it because it all flows downhill onto you, and you don't want to be there, so you mock and you destroy. What do you do? You undermine people's worth, their value, their purpose. You come after it. Mockers, the danger of being in their company is there's a pecking order, and you will join them like I joined them. You will join them if you take this road. You'll do it to not be at the bottom. You will not care about the approval of God any longer. What you will care about is the approval of a fickle, restless, and cruel people. Mockers are fickle, they are restless, and they are cruel. When we talk about being rooted, we know that that stands in stark opposition to being restless and fickle, quick to move and go and do all these things. We are people rooted in Christ Jesus. We are not unsure of who we are. Though we are unsure of ourselves at times, we know who we are in Christ. And when we look at this and understand that they are a fickle and restless people, then we can juxtapose it with this. If we know who the mockers are, then the question said, who should we sit with? Who should we sit with? Who should we break bread with? Who should we be in relationship with in this life? Well, I would say that you should be with people who are rooted, selfless, and incredibly empathetic. Empathy, 
compassion. I've seen it for especially young boys, young men. They think it's, it looks foolish or stupid to be empathetic, but I think of Jesus Christ, the most strong, servant-hearted, good man that ever lived. And when he looked out and he saw the masses on a hillside one day, it said this, that he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had a soft heart. We want to be around people who are rooted in the gospel, rooted in the law, the counsel, and scriptures of God, rooted in a community that understands that when we stand on a Sunday or Monday and we link up and we worship together, we do so as a community who knows our identity in him and our purpose in this world. It really matters who we stand with or who we sit with. But here's the fun part of it. I think we find real strength when we, um, when we share in the company of other believers. When, when we are surrounded by other believers, we find strength. I think it's just a basic human thing, and here's how I know it. Um, you gotta help me out. Guys, please, don't hang me out to dry on this. Um, anybody else here, we'll just be afraid of the dark. Thanks, Jason. Come on. Okay, so guys, anybody here feel guilty about lying in church just now? Anybody? Seriously, anybody afraid of the dark in here? Yeah. Oh, hate the dark. Sticky, tacky, you can feel it around you. I don't like the dark. And guess what? If we killed the lights in here right now, you would see the special suffering I have when I have to go from that office over there to that bathroom over there. I hate it. And you ready for this? Super disappointing time. I run. I run. I don't care. There's nobody here. I'm just like, it's all good. I get my hustle on. And I'm not made for running. I'm more for cornering at this point. Um, You know, I run across. I don't like being in the dark. I don't like it at all. I haven't liked it since I was little. My brother Lincoln, whom I love dearly, but tormented me with the darkness. Um, You know, it, it gets to me. But what's interesting is, I'll be here with like Ethan. Ethan will be at the office or something and he's with me. And he's like, hey dad, I need to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, all right, bud. And he's like, I don't want to walk alone. To which I kind of act like, I'm like, dude, you're fine, but I'll come with you because I totally feel that. And I, I follow him out, right? We get to about right here. I grab his hand and I said, there could be a clown right about here. We got to, no, I don't do that. Ethan and I walk through here like we're in charge. Why? Because there's something about having someone with you in the places that frighten you. It's just amazing. And I'll be honest, Ethan's not much bigger than this. He's in Taekwondo. He's got a kidney punch, but not much more. He can't take anybody, but why am I so confident? I don't know. It's the strength of being with somebody who believes that in some way I still wear a cape. Right? And he believes in me. That's what we look at when we say we're surrounded by other, other people. There are people in this church who believe in you and the calling of God on your life to do something beyond your own capacity. There are people who believe in you here, who want to be part of your life, who want to see you rooted into the scriptures, rooted into the community, and bound together in a smaller gathering of people who love God and are called according to his purposes. We are called to know that we gain strength from being surrounded by other people. The voice of the evil one doesn't ring so loudly when there's the voice of those around us who believe in God's purposes for us and call us to believe the same of them. Ecclesiastes says it a really uh, beautiful way. It says it this way in Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them were to fall down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands isn't quickly broken. What that's saying to us right now is that we remember that we have an adversary and we can link up in small packs of people and we can face this life a little bit closer in relationship, a little bit more integrated into one another's weekly rhythms and lives and families and we can't defend ourselves against him who seeks to destroy us. Community matters. Christians love to call it accountability, but it's really just doing life together knowing our strengths and our weaknesses, and understanding we're called to live into that idea that the one may be overpowered. You will always question yourself. When you're alone, all your worst fears come to life. 
But when you're known by someone who knows your fears but also knows that you're called, redeemed, and blessed of God to be called into that new life, that purposeful life, all of a sudden you take on strength because that's not the only voice speaking to you. The writer of the Gospel of Matthew says it, or Jesus said it this way, the Gospel of Matthew put it this way. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything and they ask for it, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, I am there with them. Again, this is why I love to say to hunters, love woods, love nature, love these things, but you can't do it alone. Church isn't in a tree stand. Church is knit into the fabric of being the church in relationship with one another. We can't do this in isolation. We were never called to do this in isolation. God calls us into these little groups and says, I am there with you. I am there with you. I am in this life with you. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. That would have made a lot more sense about 90 years ago when people wore spurs because they rode horses. Right, you put me on a horse, we're about to have an AFV moment. I'm not super cowboy good, but I'll tell you this, I do know enough that those little dangly silver wheels off the heels of a cowboy are the gas pedal for the horse they ride. Because when you put the spurs to the horse, all that thing, you know, that little hay burner takes off. It's done sitting still because something jammed into it. That's what they're saying. Spur one another onto good deeds. You actually, when you're knit together in the family of God, you have people who know where to put the spurs and get you in motion, living for God, living a purposeful, intentional life in Christ Jesus. Let us consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as... Some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I want to say this to you. If you're like, yeah, I go to church a couple times a month, here's the reality. Don't give up on meeting together. Don't think that the gathering of broken people should exempt you somehow because you're too broken or too good for them. Those are both lies that keep you out of community. Those are both lies that keep you from joining a smaller group and allow you to fully live into the identity that God has given you in Christ Jesus. What we understand is that Jesus gives us an example of community. And I want to hold something up for you. There's an original small group in the universe. There was a moment, and Scripture says it this way, that in the beginning the earth was formless and void and darkness covered the surface of the deep. But there was a spirit that hovered over the chaotic waters. And then there was a father who spoke the first word of creation. And that word was Jesus, the light of the world. There was a spirit, there was a father, and there was a son. There was the Holy Trinity, the first small group. And they did this thing called the perichoresis, the divine dance of creation. And they created things that were good and right and beautiful and holy and right and good in every way. The original small group in this world, the original gathering was God, three in one. The divine dance between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living out the creative vision, speaking clarity and light and life over the darkness and the chaos. Doesn't that sound good for your life too? That that same small group may be speaking over you yet today? Because we see it show up here in Matthew or in Luke chapter four. In Luke chapter four, we see the original small group come together once again. And it says that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Coming out of the water, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descended Under the person of Jesus Christ, the heavens open up and the Father speaks. So you have Father, Spirit, and Son in perfect rhythm together. And then the Father says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And then the Spirit compels Jesus out into the wilderness where for 40 days he eats eats nothing. At the end of those days, he's starving. We know this would be true. He's starving and the devil comes and does what the devil has always done. He misquotes God, doesn't he? If you are the son of God, do you hear the little hint of doubt? Jesus is famished, he's exhausted, he's tired, he's so hungry. And Satan says, hey, if you're the son of God, let's just introduce a little doubt right there. Tell these stones to become bread. We know what Jesus said. It was the first real kind of point of our first teaching in this. It is written. Jesus comes flying back at him with a throat punch in the word of God. And he says, 
Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Satan takes the weary, famished body of Jesus and he walks with him up to a tall hill. And he says to him, or first he shows them in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and their luxury and their pomp and their sensuality and their indulgence. And he says, I'll give it all to you if you will worship me. And what does Jesus say? No. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is written, Jesus says. It is written. He goes back to the word of God, but he also reminds Satan that we worship God. We stand and worship God. We don't worship anything else. Satan, clearly frustrated with the double throat punch of scripture, spirits Jesus to the top of the temple, the pinnacle of religious importance in the entire world. As it remains even today, He spirits Jesus to the top of the temple and then get this, get the mocking, arrogant tone of this. Satan looks to Jesus from the top of the temple and he says, jump, for it is written that he will command his angels concerning you and you won't even stub your toe when you land on the ground. The interpretation is that you're gonna float down above the temple like a god and you'll be treated like a god henceforth. How great would that be? What does Jesus say? It is written. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Don't mock the word of God. Don't stand in opposition to God's will according to Christ in that moment, according to you in your temptation. Do you see how the first two temptations begin? Did God really say, are you really... He always loves to make us question. He questions the promise of God that you were created in the image of God and that every person who draws breath on this planet is created in the image of God and Jesus died to save them. Jesus died to save them. The question is, what will we do? The reason I love this is because Jesus had a small group, not only in eternity in the Father and the, and the Spirit, but he had a small group of disciples, a practical group of men who walked with him day in and day out for three years. They knew the way Jesus smelled when he got too hot. Have you ever thought of that? They knew how he tied his sandals. They knew which hand he ate best with. They knew his weird, funny jokes that he would make at a certain moment. They knew him. They were his small group. They taught together, lived together, did ministry together. And I want to tell you something. Jesus had a small group. And he had a group of people who knew him and who needed him. But he also needed them. He loved them. And here's the hard part. You are called to do nothing other than what Jesus did. Have a group of people in your life who know you, who know your intricacies and your quirks and are part of your life. Yes, it's risky. You can look at Jesus' example. He spent three years with Judas Iscariot who sold him for 30 bucks. Sometimes it hurts to be in close community, but it doesn't negate that Jesus was there. It doesn't negate that all the disciples ran away from Jesus, save John who stood at the cross with Mary, his mother and Mary Magdalene. All of them ran away. But Jesus didn't give up on his small group. He didn't give up on his band of guys. What did he do? He restored each one of them. Even Thomas who said, I won't believe he's resurrected unless I can put my hand in the wounds of his, finger, of his hands. And they sighed. And what did Jesus do? He appeared and said, touch it. I am the one. I am him. And do you know what Thomas did? Because he was in this tight group with Jesus who forgave and restored relationships. Thomas started the church in India. Did you know in the first century, India had a thriving church? It was started by the Apostle Thomas who started his statement of, I will not believe unless. Jesus Christ and his group of people reached the known world through his disciples. He sent them out. They had failed in relationships. So here's my challenge to you today. Do what Jesus did. Believe that broken people still have a point and a purpose in your life. Believe that the people you're surrounded with today, it's nice to be in a big worship setting, but you need to be in a smaller setting. You need to be known and you need to know others. You need to care and love and hold one another up because that's Jesus' example. That's what the Lord taught us. We don't do this in isolation. We do it in community. We don't just do it in community. We do it in relationship. When we talk about the Foundry Church, we understand that many of us have lived lives 
as wicked people, as sinners, and as mockers. Yet, because of the blood of Christ, we are still redeemed and called purposefully to take the gospel into the whole world. And I think we do that best by being in intentional relationships with one another. I think we care the most when we know people's backstory. And when Satan comes to someone you love and says, did God really say you're worth loving? So, and you come and say, you know, I, I just feel these doubts. You have a friend in relationship who said, not only are you worth loving, you're purposeful. You're wonderfully and fearfully made. And God has poured into you his Holy Spirit for the purposes of expanding the kingdom of God. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. How nice would it be to have a friend like that? That's what we're inviting you to at the Foundry Church. Be in the word of God. Be in worship every week. But be known. Be known. Get into a place where you're in intimate relationship with one another. Is it costly? All the time. All the time. There's people in this room I have disappointed beyond what I can bear but we're still here, we're still doing it. Not because I've got it together, but because I want that relationship to be restored. I want to walk faithfully and assume the best and walk with people. I don't wanna be known as a caricature, I wanna be known as who I am, a broken sinner in need of grace. Don't you? Don't you get tired of the religious marching orders of looking good, having it together? Notice, Jesus never hung out with those dudes. He got tired of me. I think he kind of picked on him a little bit. Here's what we have to do. Let's ask the question that makes it uncomfortable. How do you feel when you leave a place where you've sat with people who are mockers, where they've just torn someone down, where they've just obliterated someone's character, their, their, their motivations or whatever? How do you feel when you leave a time sitting with mockers? I'll tell you how I felt. I feel dirty, I feel like I have abused someone's character, and I feel like um, I hope so much that they never hear what I said to them. Anybody else? You don't have to raise your hand or people might be nervous around you. But let's be honest, it's us, right? You leave time sitting with mockers, feeling like you're in the basement of your own soul, thinking how could I treat people like that? And the reason you treat them like that is because you don't want to be on the bottom rung. So you'll step on someone's face, feelings, heart, family to take a step up. And you feel devastated and dead inside when you're done. Do you believe that's what God wants for you? Do you believe that that's all God really has planned for you, to sit with mockers? Or do you believe that your life is like Psalm 1, called to be blessed and you are called to be rooted in Christ Jesus? And your life is to be this fruitful, whimsical, joyful, living example of forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation, and hope. Which one do you want? One of them's found by joining in God, in, in with what God's doing on his terms, not yours. The other is a justification. And I want to paint two pictures. You will either choose to get rooted into God through his word, through Jesus Christ, the gathering of worship in the small groups, or you will justify and say, I'm too busy. I got too much going. I can't do it. And you will slide into patterns of sin and eventually sit with the mockers. There's always a progression downwards. You have to choose which one you'll do. You'll have plenty of excuses of why it won't work. You can tell me, I'm too busy. Got it. I understand. I feel that. I don't trust people. Fair enough. You've been hurt. I get it. You can tell it all these reasons for it. You can look at it and say, you know, I don't think I could benefit from this. I don't think there's anything for me. So I want to ask the question, how could you benefit from a small group? How could you benefit? Or if you're in a small group, how could you really dig in and make it purposeful? Here's the thing. You've heard enough from me. I would like to turn it over and let some people who've been in small groups and walk the road tell you about it. I think it was the fact of having someone come to my house every week and that my house needed to look good and just had to be presentable every week. Part of it was the time commitment. Going into the, yeah, like, like she said, you know, to have time to get the house picked up and get clean and you felt 
Going into it, you felt like you had to entertain them. Worried about um, people coming, people wanting to share. And I think we've done that, you know, with getting to know each other and with me letting go of some of my brokenness and sharing those things and knowing that there is nothing that you can't share that I haven't heard or we haven't heard before. You know, we all have those hurts and finding out that we're all alike. I think um, the kid, when, when we brought all of our kids into one group, as they, as they got to know each other, um, I think it was, it, it got much easier and, and easier to manage. But um, we tried to include the kids. Um, you know, we usually served dinner and stuff like that in the beginning, um, and then kind of let the kids go off on their own while the uh, adults or the parents um, did their Bible study and followed the, the outline that was given to us. Um, it was a little, it was a little uneasy and a little chaotic to begin with, but once the kids got to know each other, um, I tell you, it was it was it was great for them too. They met new friends, and some of them now they do hang around with and and do things with outside of our small group gathering. So they just really got along well, and um, it's it's just a fun thing for the kids now to do too. It's not all oh, we have to go to small groups. It's oh good, we get to go play with our friends. So that was fun. Uh, we get together a lot. Kids are welcome. Not everybody has kids, but uh, two families have kids, and uh, third family's got a kid on the way, which is awesome. So we're all throughout the entire spectrum. Uh, we got newlyweds, we have some old timers with three kids, and then uh, a couple people. And uh, all the kids just get together, hang out, have fun in the basement while uh, we get together upstairs. If you're at that stage in life, by all means, I mean, all the more reason in my eyes mm -hmm. to join. Yep, it's good for your kids to see you doing um, what you do in a small group with mm -hmm. other people, praying and studying God's word and just um, having that interaction. And we try to include them in part of it as well. Um, when we pray, we like to have our kids with us and yep. just yep. even hearing the needs of the people that are in our group, um, the prayer requests and that kind of stuff. So it's, I think it's a great thing for them to hear and just to know that, you know, there's other people out there with need and um, we're here as a group praying for them and supporting them, so. Absolutely, absolutely, because they might think that they don't have the time, want to just hold it inside, but I think it's a way that we get to know each other on a personal, spiritual, way and I think that's so important that we we do that um, I mean it's one thing to pass each other in church and as we're doing after worship and greeting each other but it's another thing to become part of each other's lives and I think that's what we need to do so we can uplift and hold each other close it keeps you always growing in your faith um, you know you always can learn more uh, get other people's views on a lot of stuff and uh, everybody's going through something different and something you might have already gone through or you're going to go through and you just might not know it yet. You come to find out that what you have in common and your common struggles, it's like, it's, you have someone to relate to. It was more that I was looking forward to them coming over because um, I missed talking with them when we didn't get together. The, the, the house became less and less a concern. Um, it was, like she said, it was, it was the, the fellowship and just being able to be open and to have people come over and, and to talk about what we're hearing in the, here in the Foundry, it was, put a lot of the anxieties aside. Well, my wife and I had a, a goal for 2018 to be transformational in our faith and we thought a good first step would be to step out of our comfort zone and join a small group. So we signed up for starter group. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. It was. It was a lot of fun. And, and that comes from just joining a group and being part of it and meeting people and developing those deep friendships. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think the, the, the year was great. The Kingdom of God continues to grow by faithful, courageous obedience. And I know it's hard to look at it and say, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm in college, and I'm like, don't give me that. College people are like hardwired to be in groups. You run around like packs. But, um, but I look at you and I just go, I, I just wanna invite you. It's not something we want from you, it's something we want for you. Let the kingdom of God be built 
over your faithful obedience, over your courageous obedience, over your deepening relationship with people who are also filled with the Spirit of God, called according to His purposes, and gifted to you as a community to walk with. It's not easy all the time, but it sure is good. This next song is very invitational. It is a song that invites God to do the thing in us maybe we're most uncomfortable with. They just put it to a fun tune, and it makes it easy to sing. I'd invite you to sing it as you pray it. Stand up. Let's sing. You got a connection card in your loop when you came in. I want the application to be very clear to you. At Foundry Church, we intend to do three things. To be in the Word of God, to worship together with God, and to be in groups. Those groups are going to be where you do missions, care, you love on one another. Groups is what we're doing. Now, we have youth ministry for kids who are in that transitional phase of life and things like that. We have shakeout for our young But I'll tell you this, as families, there's nothing you can do that'll be more impacting to your families, to your individual life, than to be rooted together with other Christians to speak life over you. We are the spirit-filled church of Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell continue not to prevail. We will be a family of God, and we won't all know each other, but hopefully you know some of us. Take your cards out today before you leave and just write groups on it. It's not really a request. Be part of us. If you're going to be part of us, be in a group. Be part of the family of God, known, loved, valued, and purposefully sent out. This is not something we have to do or want from you. It's what we want for you, to be rooted in the community that God has given to you. As you go, remember these words from Matthew chapter 11, the words of Jesus when he said, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Then come to me. Get away with me and I'll help you recover your life. Walk with me. Work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace and see what life feels like. I won't put anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, but rather I'll teach you to keep company and with me and live freely and lightly. May that be true of you as you live into the high calling of not only knowing God, but knowing his church, knowing one another and pushing back the edges of darkness with the advancing kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.